السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا محمد ذي القدر العظيم وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين والتابعين لهم بإحسان وهدى إلى يوم الدين الحمد لله It is a great blessing to be in a gathering where the righteous are mentioned The ulama say in the mention of the righteous are the effulgences of divine mercy coming down upon us. Imam Abu Hanifa himself, whose life we're going to look at, would say that moments spent in mention of the righteous are more precious to me than hours spent in the review of fiqh. Why? Because the mention of the righteous gives us an embodiment of what the purpose and reality of knowledge is and qualities that remind us how ourselves to become of the true people of knowledge, of the true seekers and how we can fulfill the true purpose of knowledge. We're going to look briefly today at six lessons from the life of Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala The first lesson relates to when Imam Abu Hanifa began his studies Does someone know at what age Imam Abu Hanifa began his formal studies? This person known as Al-Imam Al-A'zam The greatest Imam The person Imam Shafi'i referred to With his famous words That people are but children before Abu Hanifa when it comes to fiqh How old was he when he began his formal studies? Someone said 10? He was in his mid-twenties, around 26 So Imam Abu Hanifa was from a righteous family and he himself took interest in knowledge but he was sort of like many people in our times are the sort of knowledge surfing. You know, he used to go to different gatherings and show up here and show up there and hang out with the ulama and stuff. But he was a businessman. And even as a businessman, he didn't dedicate himself to, to studying. But he was sort of drifting. But he was brilliant. And one of the righteous scholars saw him discussing some matters of religion with, a, with someone else and he told him, that you have great potential. Le dedicate yourself to knowledge, for great good will come from you. And he did. And he started at the age of 26. In that, of course, are many lessons right, that remind us of the words of the beloved Messenger وسلم, that مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Whomever Allah wishes well for, He grants deep understanding of religion that that understanding of religion, whether it's the personal understanding you need to draw closer to Allah, or that understanding that will enable you to benefit others, you, you can seek it whatever your age is. Men yuridillahu bi khairan, whomever Allah wishes well for, He grants understanding of religion. Many of the great scholars that we have in the West began their formal studies closer to their 40s. People like Imam Zaid Shakir, when he went to Damascus, he'd hit 40 and he had the energy of a youth. Why? Because he really wanted what he was seeking. And in that, of course, are many other lessons if you were to reflect regarding the benefit of keeping good company. And also, you know, of, they say you should keep your nets, even if you don't catch any fish, keep your nets in the water. And if, there, if you know that the fish is somewhere around there, don't just look for the fish and take their nets out. Sometimes the benefit will take time to come. So that's the first lesson. The second lesson is that Imam Abu Hanifa chose very carefully as to whom he would study with. And his main teacher in fiqh was Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. And Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman was a remarkable scholar. And you would do well to read some details of his life. But it is said regarding Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman, لَوْ قِيلَ لِحَمَّادِ أَنَّكَ تَمُوتُ غَدًا 
If Hamad were told that you are going to die tomorrow, Hamad would not have been able to increase in his good works. And there are scholars like that that one can, you know, that one can have the honor of meeting who go who are going full tilt. Right? So if they're told you'll die tomorrow, they're already doing all they could do. And Imam Abu Hanifa chose whom he study, whom he would study with carefully, but he also had the most exceptional of adab with his teacher. So, and there's many manifestations of that adab. One of the adab that he had, and these are personal choices. These are personal choices. These are not a matter, it's not a religious ruling. But Imam Abu Hanifa would never stretch his feet towards where his teacher was sitting, nor towards his teacher's house, till his death, even after the passing of Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. He would never stretch his feet towards his teacher's house. Why? Because if you recognize the value of something, it would be manifest in your conduct. A third lesson has to do with Imam Abu Hanifa and a fool. Once Imam Abu Hanifa was traveling to Baghdad in a caravan and there was a fool amongst, with them. And the fool was a fool because he was a fool, right? So he, um, all the journey, he was cracking jokes at Imam Abu Hanifa. And Imam Abu Hanifa was dressed like a scholar. He was like making fun of his clothes and this and that and you know, picking at his sleeve because Imam Abu Hanifa would wear wide sleeves and there was a dress of the ulama and Imam Abu Hanifa was calm and patient with him even smiled and laughed with him but then they reached the outskirts of the city and he told the fool that listen the whole journey I've been patient with you and it's nothing personal but now we're entering Baghdad and the people know me here and they respect me here for my knowledge and if you say one word making fun of me I'm going to report you to the authorities right. so of course there's two aspects to this right. one is the good character that Imam Abu Hanifa displayed he was patient and calm with the fool and he did not get upset for the sake of his of himself but Imam Abu Hanifa also recognized that he is not simply Abu Hanifa he is a representative of the deen he is an inheritor of the Prophet he is someone who is in a position where people are taking deen from him and he conducted himself accordingly. And there's a dimension of self-respect that is integral to the deen, but it's not self-respect as in respecting your nafs, that I'm going to defend my nafs, but rather to know that yourself, right, this yourself, I, meaning you, have great worth because you are a servant of Allah. And that's why they say, Al-Mu'minu la yudhillu nafsahu. The believer does not humiliate themselves right? and they know where Allah has placed them and they act accordingly the fourth lesson is directly related to that Imam Abu Hanifa as a scholar and teacher would advise his students to dress better than other people and for their dress to express to people who they are and what they are engaged in so he used to tell them to, for their turbans to be bigger than the turbans of others and for their jubbas to be better than others' jubbas and for their sleeves to be wider than others' sleeves. The point of course was neither the turban nor the, the quality of the jubba nor its length but rather it was to know who you are, right? to know who you are and that you have a responsibility in you're being a seeker, or a teacher, or a caller, or for that matter, an activist, in which your khidma, right, your khidma is for the sake of Allah, but being for the sake of Allah, you must not only do that which is pleasing to Allah and will be a benefit, but you must conduct yourself in a manner that will facilitate that benefit in your 
the way you carry yourself. So someone sees, they'll say, I want to be like Sister Rafaela, the distant cousin of Sister Michelle. Why? Because Sister Rafaela, mashallah, she's someone who's, ex who's manifesting that knowledge in their character, but also in their appearance and in their conduct. And this has many, as many realities, because if the fruits of that knowledge are not manifest on your comportment, then others won't take it seriously. And one of Sidi Usama, Canon's teachers, told him that, Ya Usama, Imanun nas fi ayunihim. That Usama, people's faith is in their eyes. And people respect not only on the basis of some, how someone is and what they do, but they also respect people on, on the basis of how they appear. And there's an aspect to that. But of course, the, Allah reminds us of the balance that what is the khayrul libas? What is the best of dress? It is taqwa. It is taqwa. It is the state of your heart in being pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the outward affects the inward. A fifth lesson relates to Abu Hanifa and his critics. Because Imam Abu Hanifa, if you, and all of you should read the biographies of the Imams, this should be on your seeker of knowledge reading list. You should read the begin by reading the biography of the Imam of the school that you follow, but read the biographies of the other Imams as well. That's why deliberately I'm actually not going into the beginning to end biography of Imam Abu Hanifa. But Imam Abu Hanifa pursued a unique way in fiqh. He studied hadith like everyone else was studying hadith. The first responsibility of this ummah was and is the preservation of prophetic, of the prophetic message. The preservation of the Qur'an and the preservation of the sunnah of the Prophet That is the first responsibility of the ummah, is the preservation of that message. This is why the ulama, when they see things, see troubling things happening in the world, their first concern is different. The, the U.S. invades Baghdad, the greatest challenge is not to the buildings of Baghdad or to its people. The greatest challenge is, how will we preserve our deen? That's the most important challenge. Everything else comes second. So I know scholars who when the U.S. invaded Baghdad, they still continued their lessons the morning that the U.S. invaded. And they were, some of them were advising the resistance, etc. But they continued their lessons. Why? Because knowledge has its rights. Right? Knowledge has its rights. So Imam Abu Hanifa's concern was all these people are preserving the text of revelation. The Quran and the hadith of the Prophet But there, But his concern was we need to have as much effort, if not more, in, preser in preserving the understanding. Right? And understanding is a subtle matter that with time can get dispersed. That that understanding is widespread in the generation before him, but it will get dispersed. So he devoted himself entirely to fiqh. And finding a unique temperament within himself, but also amongst his students, his circle was a circle of mujtahids. And he had the immediate circle around him, and of his closest students, they were at the level of absolute ijtihad of absolute independent judgment in fiqh. The second circle in the circle of Imam Abu Hanifa constituted people who, who had some level of ijtihad. They were also mujtahids, but not of absolute ijtihad, of lesser levels of ijtihad. And he had brilliant jurists would attend his gatherings. His gatherings weren't that big. If he had 80 people in a gathering, some hadith scholar would have 800. Because okay. numbers aren't all that counts. But the hadith scholars were freaked out by all of this. Because Abu Hanifa is sitting there coming up with theoretical issues. Someone comes and asks the question that someone stole this from me, what do I do? So Abu Hanifa would ask that question in his gathering and he'd start from the back and take questions. And then the second, and then closer to the front. And then his senior most students would then comment. 
And after everyone commented, Imam Abu Hanifa would either say he agreed with one of the positions, or he would voice his own opinion. But they're all delving in the legal nuances of the issue and the underlying legal meanings and so on. A hadith scholar, if you're sitting there looking at all of this, would be freaked out. If someone asks you a question about deen, and you're just talking about principles and concepts and definitions and where's qala Allahu wa qala Rasulullah? Where's Allah has said and His Messenger has said? And so they were very critical of him. And this is a, it's a healthy tension in Islamic history. So the Ahl al-Hadith had many critics. And amongst them, of course, after Imam Abu Hanifa was Imam Bukhari. Imam Bukhari directly critiques Imam Abu Hanifa in at least 23 places in his Sahih. But this is the adab of the ulama. Imam, Buhan, Imam Bukhari not once mentions Abu Hanifa by name. Because though he was deeply concerned that this is a very dangerous method, he thought. And he critiques him. But the adab entailed that he didn't mention him by name. He, said, he, he usually says, وَقَالَ بَعْضُ النَّاسِ Some people have said. And بَعْضُ النَّاسِ refers to Imam, Bukhari, um, Imam Abu Hanifa. That's it, adab. Right? And it was nothing personal. And an example of it not being anything personal from the life of Imam Abu Hanifa is that these critics of Imam Abu Hanifa realized something that Abu Hanifa had been doing for them for decades when he died. Because when he died, suddenly many of these scholars found that the financial support that they were getting and that their gatherings were getting and that their students were getting had diminished. Because unbeknownst to them, Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, was secretly financially supporting many of his fiercest critics. Why? For many reasons. Number one, as an expression that it's nothing personal. Right? And you sometimes have to do that, which will also contain your own nafs. Right? Because naturally, you, you, you will not like someone who critiques you. That's a natural disposition. But he wanted the good for them because they may have been at odds with him. They may have been disagreeing with him, but they were engaged in great good in preserving the deen actually. So he was supporting them to support the good that they were, do that they were doing, to express his sincere concern, to be fair with them. That's justice, adl, to give everyone their due. And also to, to do the outward action that would check any natural impulse of ego. So that's the fifth lesson. The sixth and final glimpse that we wanted to mention was that Imam Abu Hanifa was known by a title that arose from his worship and devotion. Does anyone know what that title was? He was known as Al-Watad, the peg. And he was known as the peg. And he was known as Al-Watad or the peg because of how long he stood in worship at night. So much so that once he was walking down the street and someone pointed out that that's Abu Hanifa, he prays all night. And Abu Hanifa at that time didn't pray all night, he used to pray about half the night. So the sunnah is that if someone praises you, you should say, Allahumma ja'alni khayram mimma yadhunnoon. Oh Allah, make me better than they imagine. Don't say, thank you Allah for getting someone to praise me. Okay? Sayyidina Umar used to say, Allahumma ja'alni fi ayunin nasi kabira wa fi ayni saghira. And oh Allah, make me great in the eyes of people and tiny in my own eyes. Of course, great in the eyes of people, not because I show off so much, but because you know, direct me to do that which will be of great benefit. Not just for myself, but for others. But Abu Hanifa would pray all night. Of course, what it means by praying all night isn't that from Isha to Fajr, he'd just be in prayer. It means that, he, that if you apportion the night into thirds, which is one of the sunnah ways of apportioning the night, he'd pray in the beginning of the night. He'd also pray in the middle of the night. He'd also pray at the end of the night. Right, so he'd have lengthy devotion through each of those times of the night. 
And this is of course from the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. What is the beloved messenger commanded? قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلَ Where is that in the Quran? Surah Al-Muzzammil. Read Surah Al-Muzzammil. Some people worry that, oh my God, some people are doing too much worship. The messenger is commanded to spend the, spend the night in worship. That's what the night's for. Except a little. That's the original rule. Nisfahu, right? Half of it, or a little more, or a little less. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah knows that you spend most of the night in worship. And then He says, وَطَائِفَةٌ مِنَ الَّذِينَ مَعَكَ And a small group of those with you. Right? So this is one of the bases of, of honor, right? is devotion. And that's critical for a student of knowledge. So just to recap these lessons before we, uh, as we close, the first thing that we saw, the, these six lessons, the first is, you know, from when Abu Hanifa started his studies, is that the path of knowledge is open to all. Whatever your age is, your circumstance, whether you have work or this, you can always seek knowledge. You can always seek that which you need to turn to Allah. Right? The Prophet ﷺ, the whole earth has been made a masjid for me, a place of worship. Right? And if the whole earth is a masjid, then it entails that you can worship Allah. And of course, you cannot worship Allah without knowledge. So it's possible to seek the knowledge by which you can enter into a state of ubudiyah, of slavehood to Allah, wherever you may be. The path of knowledge is open to all. Seek it in accordance to your circumstance. The second is that we saw with the adab of Abu Hanifa, with his teacher Hamad, that adab is the key to honor and true attainment. And adab is not simply proper manners. Adab is the right way of doing things. That in your rel relationship to knowledge and why you seek it and how you seek it and whom you seek it from and whom you seek it with and what you do with it. Each of these, there's adab. What is adab? Adab is the right way of doing things. And I like giving micro assignments. One micro assignment that to keep track of is read the biographies of the, of the four Imams starting with your own imam. The second micro assignment is, read up about adab in general and the adab of knowledge. And alhamdulillah, if you go to the Seeker's Guidance search, seekersguidance.org slash search, and you type the word adab, there's many answers related to adab. I would particularly encourage everyone to read, and if you already re read it, review what Al-Attas, Sayyid Naqib Al-Attas, argue the greatest living Muslim uh, philosopher of our times, and a brilliant intellectual, um, he says about adab. Because right? the whole deen is adab w with reality. Right? The third lesson is patience and good character. That the sign that the fruits of knowledge are manifest on the tree of your being is that you exhibit good character. And the sign of good character is patience and the ability to control your anger. And we see that with you know, in the story of Abu Hanifa and the fool. But we also see in that story that part of good character is char good character is based on giving others their due and to be good with others. But good character begins with yourself. Right? Because the base of good character is Aati kulla di haqqin haqqa. Give everyone as a right, their good right. And part of good character is that you have the right relationship with yourself, that you don't say I'm a loser, I'm no good, and right? you're nothing in reality, right? But you are a servant of God, so act accordingly. Right? So you, good character begins with, you, with yourself, that you conduct yourself in a manner that gives yourself its rights as a servant of God. Fourth, in Abu Hanifa's counsel to his students, is you learn that you should live as a seeker of knowledge, you should live like a seeker, outwardly and inwardly, in the way you use your time, in the way you conduct yourself. Right? Abu, uh, Ibn Mas'ud said, Sayyidina Abdullah Ibn Mas'ud, the great companion, that you can tell the person of Qur'an in his days while others are heedless, and by their nights when others are asleep. Right? And 
you know you should conduct yourself accord accordingly the fifth in Abu Hanifa supporting his critics financially is that you see the, a manifestation of the reality that this deen is based on sincere concern right that sincere unconditional concern for others and for the good and the final lesson and this is very very important and very often neglected has to do with Abu Hanifa's worship that sincerity is seek in seeking knowledge is manifest in and through spiritual routines because if you say if we say that the point of knowledge is seeking the pleasure of Allah then that should be a point of manifestation of that is that you do those things that are pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so a seeker should be actively aspiring to bring into their lives the central sunnas of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam the central what are the central sunnas of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they are the emphasized sunnas of the deen right? particularly those related to prayer and the acts of devotion right? those and it doesn't mean that you go from 0 to 60 in a moment right? it may take several steps but you're working on it and a manual that all of us should just make part of our lives is Imam Ghazali's The Beginning of Guidance Bidayatul Hidayah if you read it review it and if you have reviewed it keep checking back and be working that you should strive as a seeker from morning till night to have to punctuate your life with devotion and remembrance and that's also how you bring knowledge routines into your life of course but these are six broad lessons from the from the life of Imam Abu Hanifa we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who take the foremost of believers as our exemplars and that we seek from him to be granted what he granted them because he is the giver and he gives in accordance with his generosity and not in accordance with the worthiness of those who seek wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabina muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama taslima al-kathira